this morning, uh, we're going to have a very special service. And the reason why we took up the offering a little bit early, kind of threw, threw you off a little bit, is something new, you know, something different. I know that's kind of weird in a church, but something a little bit different. Uh, because at the end of the service, we're going to have a great celebration time. Now, we baptize a lot of people during the year. We, for a while there, we did it every Sunday. Now we're doing it once a month. But annually, we have one um, service where we explain baptism, answer all the questions about baptism, and give you an opportunity to be baptized that day. In fact, let me just say this. We can do something for you today that no other church in the world can do for you. We can baptize you today. And you say, well, that's, that's a crazy statement to make, Pastor. I mean, after all, there's a lot of churches around that baptize. Yeah, but you're not there, all right? You're here. And so we're the only ones that can do it today because at the end of this service, not trying to put you on the spot, just kind of give you a little warning, we're going to ask you to come forward and join those, uh, join the few that have already agreed to be baptized today, been looking forward to it. And right outside, we're all going to go outside, and we have three large tubs, and we're going to be baptizing people. Now, why in the world will we do such a thing? And why is it such a mysterious thing? Somebody says, well, I've already been baptized. I was baptized as a baby, or I was baptized as a child and uh, maybe later got saved, but I was baptized then. What difference does it make anyway? Well, you know, it's a confusing thing. It's a mystery. In fact, we're in a series of, of messages on unsolved mysteries, secrets revealed in the Bible. And we talked about the resurrection. We talked about salvation last week. Well, what about baptism? You know, whatever it is, this church started a new members class 26 years ago just for this reason. When I came and, and was, became the pastor, one of the questions I asked was about the new members class. I think they had one, you know, a 10, the first one. And I said, what, wh why are you doing that? Because we had just started that at the, at the church I was pastoring. And so I said, why are you doing that? So we're having people join from kind of all over the country, and they don't even know what baptism's all about. And so we're having this class, and we're going to explain a lot of different things, but the main reason why they started it was to explain baptism, because there is a lot of confusion over it. Some churches pour, some dip, some sprinkle. Some baptize babies, some don't. Some baptize, um, uh, you know, as part of your salvation. They say, well, if you're not baptized, you just can't go to heaven. Others say, no, you get baptized because you are already going to heaven. Which one's right? I mean, after all, we have a, we have a reason, I think, to be really confused. Let me just sit, tell you a little background, though, of our church. What we want to do I don't know a lot of churches claim this, and, and rightfully so, but what we want to do and what we do as a church, we, we don't ignore history of the church. It's not bad. I, I took a lot of courses in church history, and I do kind of have a little bit of grasp of it, but we go back to the Bible. What does the Bible teach about these different mysteries that we're talking about, including about baptism? You know, I respect what the church, is, church has done over the centuries, but we go back, the standard is what does the Bible teach? Because that's where it all began. For example, that's where the Lord's Supper began. That's where uh, the communion, the, that's where baptism began. And so let's go back to the start and see the purposes of that. Because again, you've got a right to be confused. Here was Jesus about to do his ministry. He had not done any ministry that we know of at this time. John the Baptist, his cousin, was his forerunner. He was to go and preach a gospel of repentance. And when Jesus came along, people would be ready to hear from the Messiah. And so that was his job. That's what he was to do. Now Jesus in this scene comes up to be baptized by John the Baptist. And it's confusing even to the biblical character John the Baptist. Let's look at it in verse 13 of chapter 3 if you'll read along with me. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. When John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered, Let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. Behold, the heavens were opened by him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, how do we unravel this mystery? First of all, I want us to look a little bit at the confusion, why we get confused. 
Secondly, I want to look at the reasons for baptism. I mean, why do we do it in the first place? And then the mode or the method of baptism, the candidates, you know, are you a candidate even for baptism? Are you? And then when do you do it? The timing of it. Let's look at it with me. Jesus had just walked about 60 miles. That's how long it took him to get from his home to uh, the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist. 60 mile walk. Now, if you look from a John the Baptist point of view, he's preaching a gospel of repentance. He's preaching about Jesus coming. This Messiah was on his way. He's coming. He's even here now somewhere, and he's going to come. And now he comes right toward him. All the crowd begins to disperse when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus enters the baptism waters. And John is probably thinking, Well, Jesus is going to baptize me, right? No, he says, Jesus said, no, I need to be baptized by you. And he says, Lord, what are you talking about? My baptism is one of repentance. You've never sinned, so how can you repent of anything? And he says, well, allow it to be so. It's fitting now to fulfill all righteousness. And so as we look at this, we look at this word, first of all, in verse 16, he says, and when Jesus was baptized. Now, what does that word really mean? Well, this word is a very unique word in the English Bible. Back when uh, it was trans the Bible was translated in English, uh, the church was already doing things like <clears throat> excuse me, sprinkling and pouring, infant baptism. And the, tri the translators of the Bible didn't want to offend the king, but they also didn't want to offend their own church and their own doctrine of what they were doing. And so instead of translating the word baptizo in the Greek, they transliterated it. In other words, what they did, okay, beta is the first word, uh, first letter of that word, so it's a B, and then the alpha is an A, and, and they went right through the word, and it became the English word baptize. And so it was never translated, very unusual for the New Testament times, and, uh, and, and really for the biblical writers and also for the translators. And so this word became baptized. What does it mean? Well, it means to wash. It means to dip. It means to immerse really is the real definition of it. You see, in the beginning, the word baptize was not a ceremonial or a religious word. It had nothing to do with spirituality. In fact, let me read you a couple of verses where this Greek word is used. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands. The word baptized, they baptized their hands. Jesus answered in John 13, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. I'm about Jews Iscariot, how he's going to give him the dipped bread. This word dipped is the word baptized. He baptizes the one I'm giving this morsel to as I baptize it. Same basic Greek word. It means to, for example, to dye a cloth. They use that word for that. They would take the cloth, they would dip it completely into the dye to change the color, they'd pull it out. They wouldn't sprinkle it, they wouldn't pour, they'd actually immerse it into the dye. When a ship was wrecked, and it went down into the sea. It was said that they, it was immersed. It was baptized in the sea. So where, do, where does all this become a religious ceremony? Well, in the Old Testament, of course, the Old Testament used Hebrew. They didn't use Greek. But they, they had washings in the Old Testament. But during the intertestamental period, we've talked about that just briefly, that time between Matthew, Malachi, rather, the last book of the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ coming onto the scene, we can find in there that 400 years, a lot of people were really mesmerized by the Jewish faith. It was the only faith at that time that was monotheistic. It was one God. Most of the religion, in fact, all of them had many, multiple gods. And so they were drawn to this strange religion. And once they got into it, began to read the Bible, many of them became proselytes. And to become a proselyte, to become a converted Jew, you had to go through five things. Number one, you had to have circumcision. Uh, secondly, you have a covenant meal. Then you pledge to the law, the Old Testament, the, the Ten Commandments, and everything that surrounds that. Then you make an animal sacrifice. And finally, you do a ceremonial washing. Now, this word, this ceremonial washing, you did it yourself. You went in and bathed, and it was kind of a sign that you were leaving the old life behind and adopting Judaism as your new faith. Now John the Baptist comes along, and he was the first one to wash you. Somebody else now is washing or baptizing you, and now 
it has a different religious connotation to it altogether. He says in verse 11, he says, I baptize you water for repentance. He was a having, he was doing a, a thing of repentance of sin. So John the Baptist, come up, the Baptist, you know, his name, the Baptist doing something new. Boy, isn't that an um, anomaly? But anyway, um, John the Baptist came along and he baptized Jesus. Now, here's the confusion. If you don't catch this, You'll, you'll really never figure out this whole thing about baptizing and, and how it fits here in the New Testament and there and everywhere. All right, number one, there were, there were, let me just say, four different baptisms in the New Testament, four different types. Number one was the baptism of John the Baptist for repentance. Now, he would come along and he was going to preach this gospel to get people ready for the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah has come. Jesus Christ has been here. He died on the cross. He rose again. We don't have a need for John the Baptist's baptism of repentance anymore. It was, there's no preparation to get involved here at all. That, that baptism was for a time. Then we have the baptism of Jesus. Why in the world would Jesus be baptized that had anything to do with your salvation at all? In verse 15, Jesus said, Let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then finally John consented. What did he mean by that? Well, remember, there were, when Jesus came, in, the Old, in fact, in the Old Testament, what you'll find in the Old Testament is two comings of the Lord. He comes one time as the suffering servant, one that would die on the cross for our sins, and the second one, as explained also in the New Testament, and the book of Revelation, he's coming as a coming king. Now, we look forward to the time Jesus is coming again, right? Sure we do. But the Jews are looking forward to him coming the first time. One of the things that we notice in the New Testament and subsequent years after that is that the Jewish faith does not see the role of the suffering servant as being a person in the Old Testament. They saw themselves as being the suffering servant. When it talks about Jesus dying on the cross in Isaiah 53, it's symbolic of the nation of Israel when it says, he says in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as he hung on the cross? It was symbolic because the Jews have suffered, not only in the Bible, but all down through history for persecu from perse persecution. And so they saw themselves as the role of the suffering servant. Now, Jesus made a decision in heaven that he would come and die on the cross for your sins and mine. He would take on that role as the suffering servant. But when did he do it? Did he do it as a baby? Did he do it when he was on the cross? No. When did he commit to doing it as a man, as a person with emotions like you and I, fears like you and I have? When did he do that? He did it right here at the baptism. He says right here, allow it to be so to fulfill all righteousness. In fact, it was so big of a celebration. The Bible says the Holy Spirit got involved. The Father from heaven, his voice came from heaven. The whole Trinity is involved in this. Why the huge celebration? The celebration was at that point, Jesus made a beeline for the cross. And three and a half years later, he would die on the cross for your sins so you and I could have a, an opportunity at eternal life. That was Jesus' baptism. We don't have to be baptized like that anymore. It was a one-time event, one time. Then thirdly, there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free. All were made to drink of the one spirit. What's it saying here? In the context of this, what Paul is saying is we're all baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And in doing that, the very moment that you and I repent of our sins and ask Jesus to come into our heart, we're baptized, we're immersed in the Holy Spirit of God. He immerses us, we immerse in Him. We are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Now, that's real baptism. That's the real baptism, salvation. So what is the water baptism? The water baptism is called believer's baptism in the Bible. Jesus said this in Matthew 28. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Notice it says baptizing. Now, whatever baptism is, keep this in mind. Jesus began his ministry, his earthly ministry, 
performing miracles, preaching sermons, teaching and discipling people, and finally died on the cross. He began it with baptism. And he ended it by commanding us to be baptized and, to, and baptize others. Here is believer's baptism. And it follows salvation because you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, into the body of Christ. And that is your salvation because you've been saved. Now you do something to picture that. In the video just a few moments ago, Kevin said this. Kevin said, I lower you, when he lowered him to the water, remember that? He said, we're buried with Christ in the likeness of his death. We're raised to walk in the glorious likeness of his resurrection. Buried with him, that means when we, you and I receive Christ and baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, we die to the old way of life. Then we were raised to walk up in a new way of life just like Jesus was when he rose from the dead. And so it pictures the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ but it also pictures your salvation as well that is what we refer to as believers baptism and that's what we're doing today if it, you say well it can't be important then because you're already saved you do it because you're saved right right why do you take communion why do you take the Lord's Supper whatever you want to call it you take it because you're already saved not to get saved that's the, the beauty of it you take it remembering the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the baptism, it's a one-time event after you're saved. We'll get to that in just a moment. But you're buried with him, and it shows that you're doing this for a reason. Now, what could those reasons be if it's not for salvation? Well, again, we say it's, it, it really isn't for Let's look at the reasons. It's not for salvation. Now, there's certain verses in the Bible on about two or three occasions that might allude to that a little bit. But if that's the case, only a few churches had that message. All the way through the message, the Bible, it teaches us that we are saved by an act of faith in the heart on our part. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. And so all through the Bible, over and over and over again, how to be saved, how to be saved, how to be saved. Well, you receive Christ into your life, into your heart, the inner core of who you are. And so what does baptism mean? Well, I'm going to share with you three things. And please hear me out today, because I've already told you about one of them, the illustration of salvation. And people think, well, it's just a symbol. What difference does it make? All you, your church believes is just a symbol. I, please, if you leave here today... You are saying something that's just not true. I'm going to give you three reasons, and all three of them are more important. I mean, are very important. Two of them are more important, much more important than the illustration. Number one, in the New Testament, it was your profession of faith. How do you tell somebody that you're a believer? You got baptized. We didn't have a, they didn't have a come forward invitation, I don't think, very often, at least in the New Testament. Basically, hey, you come forward, let's go get baptized. That's how you tell people. Chuck Colson, in one of his books, one of the great statesmen in our country, said this, most West Westerners take baptism for granted. But for many in the world, the act requires immense courage. In countries like Nepal, it was once meant imprisonment for Soviet and Chinese believers. It was like signing your own death warrant. Now, we had the privilege when I was in Atlanta, of, of pastoring some people who at one time were in the Soviet Union and at one time others that were in Romania. Both of them were communist countries in the early and mid-80s. There was still communism going on. And they had escaped communism, and I, I, they were just sharing their story with me, and they would share it with our church as well, through some broken in English, but here's, here's the brunt of it. They said when you received Christ in the Soviet Union or Romania... You weren't really all that persecuted, maybe more in Romania than Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, you would just simply, um, you know, you'd be watched from a distance. But once you were baptized, then the government recognized your ser the seriousness of your decision. It recognized the fact that you were, you were into it. You weren't just playing games with God or something or trying to appease someone else. You were taking your stand for God. And immediately you'd lose your job and find it very difficult to find work. And sometimes it meant imprisonment. To my friends that were in the church, it meant they were imprisoned off and on for believing in the gospel and being part of a church service. 
And so it was serious for them. Why? Because the rest of the world recognizes something about baptism, that you're serious about your faith. Why? Because from the very beginning in the New Testament, that's what it was. It was a public profession of faith. And then we've already said that it's your salvation il uh, illustration. Buried with him, the likeness of his death, raised to walk, and the likeness as, of his resurrection. It's sort of like the wedding ring. You know, you got a wedding ring. Many of you are married. You have a wedding ring on your finger. I mean, you remember back when you were single, some of these single people now, you know, you, you, you meet someone of the opposite sex, and you kind of look and say, do they have a ring on? You know, do they have? Well, they don't have a ring on. I got a shot, you know. And you don't have a shot probably, but, you know, at least there's some hope there. You know? I don't know. But you do. No, you know you do. You know you've looked at that uh, ring finger before and to see if that person is married or not. Why? Because, well, that's the symbol. They, they have said their vows to someone. Now, I know it's not a perfect illustration, but it does give you an idea of what it means with the illustration to be baptized. But the third thing is, is just as important as the first one, and that is it's intentional obedience. You see, salvation, or rather baptism, is not necessary for salvation in that real sense, but is necessary for obedience. And we will find, I have found in the Christian life, that those who refuse baptism usually, I mean almost always, have never really made a really genuine decision for Jesus Christ. And I don't want to judge, I'm just saying that their, the fruit of their life has not really been that way. I remember pastoring, um, not pastoring, but I was an evangelist when I was, before I pastored, and uh, just a youth evangelist, you know, just kind of go around. Anybody that would like for me to preach, I'd preach. But I'd call myself that. Sound better, you know, than just I'll fill in for you. And, uh, and so my first revival I ever preached, I think I was 22 years old, I went in this church, Vineyards Creek Baptist Church, pastored by my cousin. Uh, his name was Calvin. And so we had this really good meeting Monday night through Friday night, and uh, I think maybe Monday or Tuesday night, this lady comes forward. And... Keep in mind, I've never pastored before. I've never really handled a uh, situation where somebody's coming forward. But he was busy with somebody, somebody, a couple other people that had already come forward. He was talking with them. And it was before we thought about actually having people with uh, lay people to talk to people. And, and so I just went down forward. I didn't know what else to do. And so I came down from the stage. And she gripped my hand. She looked up. She was crying. And I mean, it looked like she got gloriously saved. And I, I imagine she's about 35 or 40 years old. And um, next year I came back, and she came forward again, tears in her eyes. And so I, I talked to the pastor about it afterwards. I said, what's going on here? You know, she was, she, I thought she was saved last year. And she said, well, come on with me. And so he took her into a room. I went with him. And again, I'm about 23 years old. I don't know what's really happening here. And he, he sat down with her and said, look, Brother Dwayne's noticed that you've come forward twice, and the reason you keep doing that and you keep coming forward and keep coming forward is because you've never been baptized. You just won't do that, and so you lack assurance in your life because you're in disobedience. God says, be baptized. You're not baptized. You have every right to doubt your salvation and be under conviction. And she looked at me, and she said, is that right? I mean, you always kind of need a second opinion I guess on things and he'd been talking to her and talking to her I said he's right I've never heard it explained better that way than that and she got baptized a couple of years later I came back not only was she involved in the church but her teenage son and her husband had been saved now I don't know whether that had anything to do with it or not all I'm saying is she began to live in victory when she walked in obedience to the Lord I shared with you a few weeks ago that when you're discerning the will of God, you're discerning the will of God, you've got to do the next thing that God wants you to do before he's going to talk to you about anything else. I mean, that just makes sense, and it's biblical as well. And so we see the reasons for it. So what, how do you do it? I mean, it doesn't make any difference, you know, the, the mode of it, the method of it. There in your next point. Well, the mode, baptize. Baptism means to wash, to dip, to immerse. And certainly, John the Baptist baptized in much water. 
And he baptized, the Bible says in, in the book of John, he baptized near Enon because there was much water there. Uh, there was much water at the Jordan River, and that's where Jesus was. I've been to the Jordan River. There's, there's not a lot of water around what we call the Holy Land today, but there's plenty of it around the Jordan River, and there's plenty of places to be baptized. You say, well, yeah, but some people sprinkle some poor. What did I say? I said, we just want to get back to the New Testament. What does the Bible teach? And both John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, Wesleyan Church, and also John Calvin, who was the founder of Reformed Church, Presbyterian Church, was founded out of that. John Calvin said this, the word baptize signifies to immerse. It is certain that the immersion was a practice of the ancient church. John Wesley had concurred in his writings. In fact, there's no recorded history where any, anybody was baptized any other way until a, around A.D. 250. And you say, well, yeah, but it's all down through church history. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not discounting church history. But let's face it, look at our country. Don't you think we've changed a lot in the last 250 years? Do you think that our founding fathers were, would approve of some of the things going on today with all the changes that have taken place? I mean, man, man alive, you know, they, they wouldn't even know how to use a, a smartphone, you know, a computer. Everything's changed. In the church, we have a tendency for the fire to go out. We have a tendency for denominations to get away from the Bible, and then people in that denomination see that and say, whoa, we need to get back to the New Testament. And all of a sudden, boom, another denomination starts to get back to the New Testament. That's all I'm saying. And so the Bible teaches that baptism means to immerse. It was the practice of the early church. No one ever in the Bible got baptized by any other way besides immersion. That's why Jesus was said he came out of the water. And so, who are the candidates? Who can be baptized? Well, it's believers only. That's why the Bible, that's what the Bible is teaching. It's believers only. Acts 2.41, it says, so those who were received his word, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, keep in mind that when you're talking about baptism in the Bible, it always follows salvation. In Acts chapter 8, in the history of the early church, an Ethiopian eunuch was going through the wilderness, and God just moved Philip and, and just translated him, really, beamed him over into the desert, it looked like in the Bible, and he began to talk Jesus to this Ethiopian. And they came across a body of water as they're riding around their chariot. And he said, what hinders me from being baptized? One of the things about the Ethiopian eunuch, he was already a converted Jew. And so he knew all about the ceremonial baptism stuff. He says, what hinders me from really converting over to what you're saying? And he says, first, Philip said, first, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And then you can be baptized. It says that in Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 2. We read it over and over and over again. Now, some of you here today maybe were sincerely baptized as a child or a teenager, but you said, no, you know, really, I, I didn't really understand it back then. I'm really understanding it today, and I've really been saved since then. Well, then you've been baptized, but you've been baptized on the wrong side of the cross, as they say. My wife gave a testimony a few years ago about assurance of salvation and how she was saved at a very young age. And later in life, she began to have her doubts as a teenager and on through adulthood. And we were in seminary, actually, where she heard a message from Jack Taylor. We came home. We discussed it. She prayed, said, Lord, if I've never been saved, I pray that you would save me now. And then years after that, she just suddenly realized through a, a, a series of meetings we were having, um, with another preacher, actually. He was preaching on the whole idea of assurance of salvation, and she came to the place in her life where she realized, hey, I was really saved back there in those seminary days, and I've been baptized on the wrong side of the cross. And she got rebaptized, or really baptized for real for the first time. There's some people here just like that. You're a candidate for baptism. You're a candidate for baptism if you receive Christ into your life. You've never been baptized before, but you've prayed to receive maybe Christ with me during one of our services. You are a candidate. Why? First you're saved, then you follow the Lord 
in believers' baptism. Baptism always follows salvation. Now, you ask, what about babies? Well, I'm going to share with you how many times a baby was, was baptized in the New Testament. You ready? Okay, that's it. That's how many. In fact, until AD 251, there is no recorded history that we know of that says babies, infants, were baptized. They started being baptized 200 years. And again, a lot, of, a lot can happen in 200 years. A lot of new doctrines can come in in 200 years, and they did. A lot of new, new even cults were started. False religions were started within that 200 years. And so the church said, well, this is a lot, a lot better. In fact, it's a kind of a covenant thing. You know, the, the covenant of the Old Testament was circumcision. Now the covenant of the New Testament is baptism. The problem is it confuses. So many people think, well, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I'll be bab you know, baptized by uh, sprinkling, and I was baptized as a baby. I didn't know what was going on. Listen, we can't think that we could possibly be saved from our sin and, and forgiven without asking, and then someone simply asking for us, our parents covering for us, or, some, or the pastor covering for you. It's a personal thing with you and the Lord. Now, when was it started being practical? I say 8251. That's my research. I was uh, reading an article by someone who differs on the subject, and their denomination does baptize infants. And he said the first one was, I think it was AD um, uh, 152. Well, that's still 100 years. There's nothing, he even admitted, there's nothing recorded in the New Testament about it and for 100 years afterwards. Well, here's the thing. We're baptized by faith. It's an act of faith on our part. It's not anything that we do on the outside. But because we are saved, we simply need to follow the Lord in certain things in, in obedience to Him. And baptism is really one of the first things. Because when do you do it? You do it right away. You do it immediately. Again, when we were looking at the will of God for our lives that GPS and how we're going to discern God's will. I shared with you something maybe unusual for you. Maybe you've never heard it before. But I said there's sometimes I recognize the fact that God is not going to speak to me about his will right then about a certain thing. You say, well, why not? Because I've discovered that as soon as God speaks to me about something, he wants me to immediately do something about it. Otherwise, he, he would hold off and wouldn't speak to me about it. Even education. Somebody says, well, I really feel like God wants me to go to this college, and I'm only a, a sophomore. Well, you need to start making plans if he really has led you there and prepared you. Remember that story, that little illustration, uh, example I gave you. Well, it's the same way with baptism. You've been told this morning, you've been shared with from the Bible the truth about what the Bible says about baptism. Now, it's in your court. That decision's in your court. What are you going to do about that? Because whatever you do, you do it immediately. My, my children were uh, all, all made a profession of faith at a very young age, elementary school. And they understood the gospel. I made sure they, I really did make sure they understood that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, what a sin was and is. I made sure they understood the resurrection of Christ and what it means to invite Jesus into your life and heart. But about baptism... I wanted them to understand it's an act of obedience, number one. And number two, it's how you tell other people you're a believer. You identify with him. Why did Jesus baptize with us? To identify with us. Jesus was baptized as a suffering servant. Take on that role to identify with mankind as one of us. Now we are baptized to identify with him. That's what they needed to understand. Once they just understood those two simple things, it was time because of their conversion, it was time to be baptized. Now, what about you today? You can kind of, you know, there's three different types, three or four different types of people in this room. There's people that have uh, never been saved. You've never received Christ into your life. Today needs to be that day. Don't, don't put that off. Well, you're just playing Russian roulette with your life. Secondly, there are people here that have been saved. You, you've invited Jesus into your heart, but you've never followed him in believer's baptism. Today is that day. How simple can you get? You come forward in a service like this. Uh, a counselor begins to share baptism with you just to make sure you understand it. And we baptize you right out here with, with a lot of other people. 
We, we expect probably, we'll probably baptize maybe close to 50 people today. You can be one of those. It's your opportunity. And I know some of you are thinking, wow, you know, I was wondering about baptism. Who do I call? I need to be baptized. Who do I call? What do I do? What hoops do I have to go through? You don't have to question anything. You come forward. We've got the shorts for you. We've got the T-shirt for you. You can change back into your uh, clothes when you, before you leave here if you'd like. We've got everything prepared for you. There's no big questions to ask. There's no place to go. It's here as an opportunity for you. And then the third type of person is the person who's been baptized but on the wrong side of the cross. Don't you want to get that right? Don't you want to be baptized the way the New Testament says? Don't we all want to be baptized the way Jesus was baptized? They're in the Jordan River, dipped, immersed completely. Not criticizing anybody else's religion, just simply doing what the New Testament says to do. No argument, just simply this is what the Bible says. I've got a friend of mine who pastors the First Baptist Church of Naples, Florida, large church. And um, he became um, actually a pastor of a large church out in Texas before he came to Naples. And um, at this church in, in um, San Antonio, Texas, and um, he was um, in his 30s. And in this church, in this particular church, they had um, large, long steps leading up to the baptistry. We have this back here, but it's really on the same floor, the third floor, um, as, um, as a lot of other things, with the, like the choir loft and everything across the hall. So you don't have to climb a lot of steps. We've got an elevator. Well, back then, this, this church did not. And you had to climb and climb and climb. I mean, we're talking about 30, 40 stairs. And you climbed up, you got baptized, you had to climb back down. Well, my friend had his baptismal robe on, and he was ready to go up. And as he was ascending up, he noticed one of the men he was going to baptize that day, 75 years old, on a breathing machine, barely able to make it up the steps. And he was holding on to the rail with one hand, his breathing machine on the other. He had the, the, the nose piece. And he was climbing up, trying to make it up to the top of the stairs. And my friend Hayes said, look, let me help you with this. You know, let me carry this for you. Let, let me do something for you here. We'll, we'll get up here together. And the man said, Pastor, if my Jesus can carry his cross to Calvary and die for me, I can climb these steps and get baptized for him. Now, brother, that's a testimony. So what about you today? Where do you stand with him? What an opportunity. It's just there waiting for you to join with these others that are going to be coming here in just a few minutes. And that's what you need to do as your pastor. If you were my own children sitting out here in the auditorium and the ages of most of you, I would say today is the day. If you haven't done it, today is the day. Do it today. 